police officers have to hide in the bushes around the corner in a parking lot in order to wait for you to violate the law, to do this horrible thing that they're out to stop, and then they catch you and they write you a ticket. Are they effective hiding in the shadows? No, the most effective time is when they turn on the lights and siren, pull out onto the street and park. Everybody on the street slows down. Wow. So true. <laughs> and so why not just park on the side of the road and wave at people? Welcome to Conversations with David Ibarra. Today our guest is Chris Burbank, Vice President for Law Enforcement Strategy with the Center for Policing Equity. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for having me, David. Well, we've got a lot of topics to get into. So first of all, why don't we start with exactly what you're doing now and what your mission is with uh, changing policing across this country? Well, the Center for Policing Equity is a nonprofit, research-driven action group. And so what we do in a nutshell is we evaluate the actions of policing to determine does the outcome work? Does it truly reduce crime? And then what is the disparity? What is the racism that is being driven by the activities that police officers engage in every single day? And so we look at specific cities. We look in generalities across the country. We look in areas to say, all right, these are the things that work and are effective. And these are the things that we should maybe do away with. Wow. You must be busy. I would imagine there's a lot of cities all across this country that are, are looking for solutions to uh, improve the things that are, are, are happening as far as uh, Black Lives Matters and other accusations to policing. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, we have exploded in the last few years. Uh, we've been around for almost 13 years. So I was on the original uh, advisory board to the group. And then when I retired seven years ago, there were seven of us sitting around a table. Mm -hmm. I, I think at last count, I heard we have 154 employees across the country now. And we're looking to add more. So we are extremely busy, which is an unfortunate commentary right. on the state of policing throughout the nation. Well, there is no doubt in this time period in America, we're in a very, very different place. You know, when, when we look at how our minds work, positive state of mind versus a negative state of mind, you look at our politics, the screaming, the yelling, we're in this negative state that seeds us with thoughts that normally don't come out with uh, uh, good outcomes. Tell me what, without, I, I don't want to name some of the incidences because there's so many of them. Uh, too uh, many to uh, name, unfortunately. Too, too, too many, but what, what do you think is happening in America and with policing and with our communities that we're so a suspect of, of each other and we're having these uh, bits of violence that are occurring in the interaction with police and uh, community members? Well, I think we need to look back a little bit because mm -hmm. historically, policing has been a very effective arm of oppression. When we look at Jim Crow laws, when mm -hmm. we, right, policing began as controlling runaway slaves. That's the birthplace of policing in America. And as we've progressed, we've continually engaged in enforcement activities that introduce tremendous bias, tremendous disparity in the outcome. And what we know from good science throughout the years is race is not an indicator of criminal behavior. Mm -hmm. Then why the outcome of policing in America is there are so many black and brown people incarcerated? Wow. Mm -hmm. And we have to look and say, there is a problem. And the failure to recognize and stand up and say, no, we need to change something is not an officer problem. This is where we get confused, right? We all want to point fingers at a police officer and say, if they weren't racist, if they, if they just weren't heavy handed, right? We can go down the list of those things that we don't like about policing right now. But more important than the actions or the bias of the individual officers, and this has been studied, right. is the policy practice and procedure. That is a leadership issue. And that failure to lead throughout the nation has led to the situation that we are in now. Well, you know, I, as, as I look at interaction with uh, police leadership and our communities, you can almost tell the attitudes 
by the look and presentation of leaders as they enter into the interaction of a community, whether it's a parade, whether it's a, 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 a festival or what have you. I want to, uh, and, and that brings me to when you were talking, I had an image of you. And uh, let's tell <laughs> our uh, audience a little bit about, I believe that you were in Salt Lake City policing for 24 years. And if I'm not mistaken, you were the chief of police for nine years? For nine years. Yes, I Correct. spent actually 25 years total in law okay. enforcement, mm -hmm. uh, all in Salt Lake City. I was very fortunate to have opportunities, you know, coming up through the ranks. I held every rank in the police department and eventually the police chief. Rocky well, Anderson was yep, the mayor yep. at the time. Yes, I, I want to interrupt you just for a minute, okay? And I won't do this much because I know I couldn't. <laughs> but the thing that the image that I remember being a longtime uh, resident of the city is you were everywhere. In every event, I would see you show up. And when you showed up, it was way different. You had a smile on your face. You were saying hello to people. People were yelling out your name. And you just simply fit with every member of the community in every neighborhood. And I used to look and say, wow, the, that is the way that it ought to be. Well, thank you very much. My, my personal belief and philosophy is that policing is representative of the community in which they police. And my role as the police chief was to demonstrate to every citizen, right, no matter what their activity was, no matter who they were, what they looked like, that I represented them personally. And that a police officer, right, I wore a uniform all the time, mm -hmm. was actually there to participate with them, right? That's how you, in essence, reduce crime, is the participation of everybody. This silly notion that policing right, and the activities thereof have some result or some impact on crime is absolutely wrong. We can prove that scientifically. Wow. It is about the community coming together and saying, no, we're not going to tolerate this in our community. Not the heavy handedness or the overdriving or overarching policing theory that goes into play. This is about getting the community to buy in. No, we want to be better. As a I, whole. J just to set up for our audience, your experience, I want to stay in this uh, topic for a moment and then get back to the work that you're doing currently. But you uh, were involved in several national uh, uh, efforts. And as a matter of fact, I believe that you were one of seven police chiefs in America that was chosen to uh, go and have a discussion with the president of the United States, Barack Obama, at the time. Tell me about that. Well, again, I had a, a very fortunate career. So I was the vice president of the major city chiefs, so the 70 largest agencies in the United States and Canada, as well as many other organizations that I was involved in. But in this particular organization, we chose to lead out on things like immigration issues, right? What should policing and immigration look like? What should guns in America look like? How do we reduce violence in America? And so having taken positions and given out advice on this is how it should be testifying in front of Congress. I found myself sitting in the president's in the old office. <laughs> and having a discussion. And the thing that I value most about that. So there was the president, the vice president, the attorney general, uh, director of Homeland security is the president wanted to listen to what we had to say. Wow. He wanted to debate. Right. I've sat in many politicians' office where they right. nod their head, shake your hand, and you take a picture, and they send you out the door. Right. No impact. Mm -hmm. When he introduced his legislation to reduce the impact of gun violence in America, it had a lot of what we discussed in that office that day. Cool. That made me extremely proud. It's one of the moments in my career that I point to and say, wow, I, I think I made a difference there. Cool. Now, with gun violence, and again... I don't want to mention one school because there's too many. We have mass shootings in America, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, almost daily. The definition of a mass shooting is uh, the killing of one or, or two or more people by a shooter. Is, or am I, is, well, what's the definition? So it actually is more people. Yeah. So at the time when Trolley Square happened here yes. in Salt Lake City, that did not qualify as a mass shooting. Wow because not enough people were killed. That is, 
again, an unfortunate commentary on society that we've got to look at each other and say, hey, wait a minute. I view human life as one person losing their life. Yes. As unnecessary and inappropriate. Right. How can we say, oh, no, five was not enough, right? So we're not going to rise that to the level where we take extreme action. Five was not <laughs> enough. Whoa. That's a scary thought. That is a scary thought. Well, so one of the things that I wanted to uh, clarify is that your qualifications are off the chart. Could, while you were the chief, the blend of the Salt Lake City Police Department with it, the activities that were going on, were it, it was just one city. And it was a clean city. It was a safe city. It was walkable. It was everything that every politician is saying they want to be. And we were once, and we're not now. Let's let's flip back to continuing with your work across America currently. What kinds of things are are you seeing that are successes? What kinds of things could you tell us about an example of where somebody was that sought your help? It was interesting. I was in Philadelphia, and I can't remember if I was talking to the mayor or the chief of police, but somehow, just out of the blue, guess whose name come up? Yours. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and they do you know Chris Burbank? And, and I nobody said, spit after saying that, right? No. <laughs> oh, all right. And, they, and they shared with me they were seeking the advice of you in some of the situations that they had. And I and, and, and that right then it dawned on me, now, wait a minute. If Philadelphia is seeking your advice, why in the hell is not Salt Lake City seeking your advice? But we'll get back to that. Tell us. Do you have some examples of, 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 of what your organization has been able to do to create improvement? Well, absolutely. And so what we look at is, again, what is that intersection between policing and race? And why do we have negative outcomes when it comes to that? And when we look and we say, and the perfect example, right, there is no correlation between the act of writing a ticket and improved safety on a roadway. Why then... Do we continue to write traffic tickets at such a high rate? And if you think about this, right, police officers have to hide in the bushes around the corner in a parking lot in order to wait for you to violate the law, to do this horrible thing that they're out to stop, and then they catch you and they write you a ticket. Are they effective hiding in the shadows? No, the most effective time is when they turn on the lights and siren, pull out onto the street and park. Everybody on the street slows down. Wow. So true. <laughs> and so why not just park on the side of the road and wave at people? I've Everyone been, will I've slow been down. stopped by one of those guys <laughs> oh, behind I'm sure the bushes. Oh, you have. We all have. <laughs> but again, there's no correlation between improved safety. Things like speed bumps, flashing speed signs, just an officer parked on the side of the road. All these impact traffic safety, and guess what? They don't care what color your skin is. Well, so a traffic ticket might have something to do with revenue producing? Well, without a doubt, historically, it has a tremendous amount to do with revenue producing. But we also have this notion, right? This is the society, right? If I were to ask you, what are the things that the police can do to make cities safer? Mm -hmm. You're going to say, write tickets, arrest people. No, there's actually no proof that those have anything to do with the outcome of crime. In fact, scientifically, the access to health care has more impact on crime in an area than the acts of policing. Tell me about that. Well, so uh, what again, you have a research institute, right, with a bunch of PhDs that want right. to study what's going on. So they take everything that's going on in the city and say, all right, let's look and see, right? Police officers, they arrest lots of people, right? Stop and frisk in New York City. So if you remember that. Yes. Hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people, were stopped and frisked and their rights violated, right? A court of law said, no, 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 that's a violation of the civil rights of these people in New York City. Right. And many people credit stop and frisk with the reduction of crime in New York City in the late 90s. Well, you look across the country, crime fell dramatically across the country. Crime fell dramatically in Salt Lake City if we didn't engage in stop and frisk. We didn't violate people's rights. Why did crime go down? 
Well, because there were other factors. There were economic factors, right? There was education factors. These things, again, have much more impact on policing than the acts of policing. But we have all watched TV for many years. We've all historically known that, oh, no, you want to stop crime, you arrest more people. But when we look and say, all right, who are we arresting, right? And the perfect thing is playing out in our city right now. Okay. You have violent crime in the neighborhood. Right. So you put more police officers there. Look and see what they're arresting people for. Not for violent crime, right? For low level quality of life issues. These start to impact the homeless. In fact, any program across the country where you have cops on dots, where you have more police officers, saturation enforcement, Comstat. Well, you're looking at a city that has tremendous disparity problems in the outcome of policing, and they are arresting black and brown members of our community at a much higher rate. Wow. Well, you just uh, opened the door to something <laughs> that I have got to make a comment on. The other night, uh, I was um, reading the paper, watching the news, and I seen our mayor and uh, Chief of Police Brown stand up and almost wanted to, I thought the balloons were going to start to pop and go up and celebrate that we, in this city, wanted to convince the residents and the rest of the state that things were well under control. We have a 9-plus percent decrease in crime. I about spit up my food. I said, who in the world? And I looked at her and I said, that look, you must have had to practice. And the chief talking about the most innovative program he had seen in 30 years of his policing was to put more police officers where there's crime. And I go like, uh, am I missing something? Or is this a duh moment? Tell me, what, what, help, enlighten me on, on, on what... What were they talking? Was was you know? I I wanted to say that was just the big lie, but I didn't want to say lie, but I just did. But it it, it had to be an orchestrated misrepresentation of 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 data to try to convince people in this city that things are under control and crime is going down because it has never been worse in this city in the entire time I've lived here. Well, so we have the ability. <laughs> Right, across the country with the media, with everything, to look at statistics and say, all right, crime's up, crime's down. Well, is that a 10-year period? Is that a one-year period? Is that over last year? Right. I, yeah. I love the comparisons that take into account the COVID years, we'll call them. Right. Well, you have to put, you know, from a research perspective, a big asterisk next to anything that says, oh, that was during the time of COVID or immediately after, because Nobody knows exactly what the impact of that was. And to say, oh, no, it's up, it's down, it's done anything else. More importantly, right, if you have an area in which you have some problems, and it can be crime, it can be, you know, just, again, quality of life issues, it can be just a perception that exists. Why not put more police officers there? This is nothing new. But the question then becomes, what are they doing? Okay. Right, police officers standing on a street corner. In fact, we'll take your parking lot. Mm -hmm. If I were to stand in your parking lot every day for four hours in a uniform, you're going to have less disorder in your parking lot. Just naturally. Absolutely. I don't need to write a ticket. I don't need to frisk anybody. I don't need to do anything other than to shake hands and wave at people. <laughs> right? But Absolutely. now we send forth these police officers, what are they doing? Mm -hmm. Right? They're writing low level arrests. They're mm. not arresting people for violent crime. I have not heard of a single homicide suspect being arrested in this neighborhood because of this effort. And yet we pat ourselves on the back and say, look at the job we've done. Well, no, you put more police officers there, but what have you done historically? What have you done to that community? What have you done to some of those families that who now get a ticket that they can't afford to pay, that they may end up in jail for? You and I are very fortunate, right? Mm -hmm. We... If we get a ticket, yeah, speeding or otherwise, yeah. have access to mm -hmm. legal help, have the means to pay for it. Or give it to your assistant to pay. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and there's so people right. in the so community right. that don't have the ability you're to so do right. this. So, so right. justice is no longer equal. 
And yet we put an enforcement activity on there that affects everybody, not just the criminals. I I may have heard this wrong, but, you know, I listened uh, uh, to a um, uh, news uh, release or uh, a press conference that the Pioneer Park Coalition had, and you hear Scott Howe talking about, uh, and, 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 and I look at it when any of these organizations uh, uh, are talking about the same thing and they're sharing incident after incident after incident after incident, their emotions get carried away. And I remind them, don't just talk about the incidences. There's multiple things involved in the experience that the individual is going through is tragic. The uh, a business owner is going is tragic. The a mom and dad that can't send a kid out to play anymore in the neighborhood. It is tragic. There is nobody who wins. But when one person says from an association, we've got to uh, have more people uh, that experience in jail in order to have accountability. And our administration, uh, the mayor says, no, 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 shame on you. And then in that same report, I heard we're going to have more jail. And, uh, and, and so I, I, I look at this, the, that, that is, is, again, it goes to the aggressive act in what you had just said. If you have more officers there, just being there and like you did, shaking hands and waving, crime's going to go down. Well, address the underlying needs, right? Mm-hmm. We all have the need for somewhere to live, yeah. for a job means, something to eat, right? Mm-hmm. And health care. When those needs are not met, there is disorder and it causes problems in society. Now that can be somebody just asking for money sitting on the street corner. It can be somebody committing a crime. Let me, let me ask you this. You know, you're a data-driven uh, person and, and, and frankly, I, I am as well. I, can't, I just can't imagine going forth on a whim without having some data to uh, guide me. But, uh, at, you know, as we look at uh, 911 calls, and I don't know what the, the uh, uh, average time for a 911 call was during the time period you were chief. Do you, do you Six recall? minutes. Okay. And now we're 17.6 minutes. And I heard our chief of police uh, uh, having the goal of 10 minutes when, uh, if I'm not mistaken, your organization would know this. What would be first in class as far as the response time for a 911 call? Well, they prioritize them, right? And so a priority one call would get the fastest service. I I will tell you, I used to have to answer to Rocky Anderson every single month as to how quickly we were getting to priority one calls for service. I understood (laughs) it's somewhere around four to five minutes. So you were close to it. His mark was six, right? We had to be better than six. Well, now our goal is 10. And why would we want to be 10 if that's almost double what is outstanding. So it just seems like we continue to make measurements that would be ordinary and then want to convince everybody that the only time that this mayor and this chief could lead is during good times, when there's no COVID, when there's not an earthquake. And if I hear that anymore, you know, us in businesses, we we had to get, we had to react to COVID. We had to react to an earthquake. We continued to move forward. Americans, uh, Salt Lakers in their homes had to continue to figure out how to move forward. But our administration said I couldn't because of. Well, you know this as well as I do. We look historically at those people that we hold up as leaders, right? Mm -hmm. We'll go with George Washington. Mm -hmm. It was the moment of crisis in which they demonstrated their leadership and ability. And that's why we revere them. Not when it was good times. It's when there was a problem. I, I can tell you this. I know you and Rocky if we'd had an earthquake and City Hall was closed, there would be portable offices all throughout that lawn and leaders would have shown up to work. It, uh, the police department wouldn't be, uh, they would be shown up to work. And you're so right that during crisis is when you know that people have the experience and the wherewithal and the grit to show up and lead. Well, that's when historically those people that we revere have distinguished themselves. Tell me, what do you, uh, a past uh, a chief of police, uh, I, I got to tell a story. I wasn't going to, but I'm going to anyway. You know, uh, some of the police officers uh, have talked to me. 
uh, they can't share their names because they're afraid of, um, you know, uh, their uh, retribution that will be brought against them. Uh, but they shared with me, David, uh, we need more police officers. And then I asked them, I said, well, what does the data show that the 911 calls are from? And they said, boy, you know what? If the truth was known, we'd be about 60% that has to do with folks that are displaced, experiencing homelessness and what have you. So if we don't address that, we're never going to get to protect and serve because all the calls will be chewed up on, on, on an issue that is not being addressed in this city right now. And that's our crisis on homelessness, which creates a crime problem, what have you. What, 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 what are your thoughts on that? Well, people who are suffering uh, housing insecurity, mm-hmm. right, the inability to have the place to go to every single night are absolutely in a situation that creates crisis, right? And that's for the people around them. Mm -hmm. That's for their family members. That's for themselves. And we time and time again have failed to look and say, what are the underlying needs? One of the biggest mistakes that we've made in the history of this city is to take all the homeless services and disperse them throughout the entire county. Mm -hmm. Now think about this. If you have no ability to drive, you have no vehicle. Right. And I need medical help or job assistance, and it's clear across town or in another city. How am I going to get there? Am I going to get there? More than likely not. And when somebody else points you to where to go. Yeah, it's over there. It's over there. Well, over there that is reasonable is the next block. Over there that's 25 blocks away is a barrier that is far too distant for anyone to get access to. And so what we've now done is not only have we dispersed the services, but historically, people who are in that crisis view the downtown corridor area as their neighborhood, Mm -hmm. right? It's where services are available. Quite frankly, it's where people are who will give you money, where they Mm -hmm. can get food, Mm -hmm. right? That's where this community has traditionally lived. Why do we not go to the community where the need is and solve the problem as opposed to trying to send them somewhere else? And now that we've dispersed this, right, and you've put men in one location and women in another location and families in another location, well, you have in essence, right, divided (laughs) the people that they want to interact with. And... To maintain that is a is I was told by uh, I went out and visited San Antonio, uh, and uh, there they have a campus where everything is within it. A good location and, and, to and, 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 evaluate. And a good location, and somebody comes in uh, uh, in in a in a bad condition, and, and 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 they need to lay down because they can't walk. They're treated with so much love in the voice and tone. This is where you're going to be, and Chris, if you want to. I can walk you through that door through detox. And when you get through, I can walk you through that door for assessment and we can, no, no, no. Okay, great. When you're ready, we'll be ready. Whether it is a a dentist, whether it is mental health, whether it is a daycare center, whether it's all in one place segregated for uh, uh, purposes of security, children are not going to be, but it is there. And when, we walked that city. We didn't see no tents. When I took a, folks for a tour of that uh, of the river walk, you didn't see no tents, and you'd certainly see a few people sitting behind a building or what have you. But wow, what what happened? That used to be our city. Well, I will tell you, when the evaluation was being done on what to do with homelessness, Mm -hmm. right, with this population in Salt Lake City, that group that was evaluating was referred to San Antonio Mm -hmm. because I referred them there. Did they go? Well, I don't know if they went or not, but they certainly didn't go with a model that was similar. Yeah. I I, I question whether they went and the idea of, 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 of integrating all of this into uh, neighborhoods of the ballpark district, but Again, I guess we got hope. We've got a substation at the ballpark uh, district now that uh, is going to be open 24 hours a day. The only problem is nobody's in it. 
Okay, and see, this is where I have to get after you, David, because <laughs> putting a police substation does not help homelessness. <laughs> well, right? I have no idea put what that... Put a job services, put yeah, a food well, bank, put well, health care. Well, correction, that was not my idea. That was know, the mayor's and the chief's idea. <laughs> well, no, I, but I, these I, are I, the I, things I, that we continually go to. Let's put more police officers there. No, let's actually meet the underlying needs that these people have. Let's solve the problem. Oh, and we amen. won't let's solve the problem. And I'll tell you what, uh, uh, Senator Bennett, and, and when I was, uh, uh, one of the greatest books I ever read was Gaining Control by uh, Senator Bennett. And the seminars were done by a individual, by, um, oh, for heaven's sakes, I've forgotten his uh, name now, uh, Smith, uh, in, in, in their company, the uh, Franklin Company. But he talked about if you want to be a fool, attack the behavior you see. If you want to be a leader and assist, go upstream until you find the cause, fix the cause, and the behavior changes. For sure. Wow. Chris, I think we're at the end of our time. Man, I, I tell you what, I don't even want to stop. This has been great. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on our show. A pleasure. Thank you. Perfect.